Hey everyone, welcome back. In the previous episode, we took a look at how to use the OIDC client to set up the sign-in flow, basically putting all of our information into this configuration and then finding out what the user manager interface uh, can do for us. Uh, as well as uh, setting up a callback sign-in. So this is when we're redirected back to our JavaScript client and we process the URL that contains all the information about our user. In this episode, we're going to take a look at persisting the storage of uh, the ID token, access token, and the rest of the stuff, as well as uh, requesting more claims in the access token or the ID token is going to be very similar to the ep episode for the code flow, if you've watched that. And as well, we're going to take a look at how to refresh the access token. So let's go ahead and first of all, let's take care of the persistence. Because at the moment, if you watch the previous episode, our information is stored in the session storage rather than the local storage. And if we take a look at the OIDC client, it will say somewhere here in the documentation for the other settings that you can provide uh, in terms of the user store. Basically, here you can specify a place where you would like to store this. And uh, the option that they provide here is you can just go ahead, copy this. It's basically our, us setting the user store property on the configuration and setting it to be a window.local storage, essentially the local storage of the browser, right? So let's go ahead, copy this setting. And what we'll need to do, we'll need to pass it in the configuration here. And uh, we will also need to just append it with the OIDC namespace kind of thing. All right. The next thing we also want to take, grab this option. So when we sign back in, we also want to supply this option here. Otherwise, it's just not going to work because on the site, uh, on the callback, we basically, we tell it where to store it. On the main one, we'll be telling it where to read it from, right? So both of the settings have to be identical. And again, when you're working in the spy environment where you have tools that help you with environment variables, etc., this is a lot easier to achieve. Uh, so let's go ahead, save these two and let's run the application. So here we have our homepage. Let's go ahead and first go into the application section and make sure that we have nothing in there. So application and uh, local storage as well. Let's check that, right? So both are empty. So what we want to do now is we want to sign in just like we did before. Uh, and let's go ahead and call the API so we know that it's working. All right, so we call the API, we get the secret message. And now if we look at the application, our session storage no longer contains this. And let me just reopen this just in case, showing some old stuff. Session storage is empty and uh, there's not much to it. All of our stuff is now in the local storage. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So now if we close the application and start it again, we can go ahead, take a look at the local storage again and our information is still in the browser. So after closing down and restarting, we will call the API. And we, we can still basically call it before. Uh, if we would have closed down the session, essentially all of our sign-in information would be gone. So this is something similar to a persistent cookie. And again, you can see that it doesn't take much to move your storage from session into local storage, right? And that gives you the persistence. Uh, next thing that I would like to cover is basically adding claims uh, to your ID token and to the access token. So for this, Let's go ahead first go into the secret controller and I'll just put a breakpoint here. Uh, again, I guess we can start it up and just see what, wh where to find these claims and where we're essentially looking for stuff in case you haven't watched previous episodes. Uh, so if we go to the application, uh, wherever we're doing the storage of our user, we go ahead and look in the profile section and this is where the user claims are. The rest is just information about the access token, ID token, and uh, just to refresh your memory, the claims that are going to end up on your client, which is your JavaScript client right now, are going to be in the ID token. Access token claims should not be for your client. They should be for when you access the API and should be read there. Again, the profile are your claims. So if you want to add additional claims, you will have to request them through the scope and set them up as I showed you in the code flow uh, tutorial about claims. So if you haven't watched that, go ahead and watch it. This is essentially where we want to see our claims being added. And if we call the API, uh, this is essentially where we want to see claims being added for our access token, right? Uh, 
So the claims that we have been playing around with before in our configuration has been the RC grandma claim, which we're adding in the startup of, sorry, in the program.cs when we register, where we, when we create our user, right? So we want to see this claim on the client. So when we look in the memory store, we should see the RC grandma claim with RC cookie. I remember exactly what it's called. And then when we request the API2 resource, that's when we get the RC API grandma claim put into our access token as well. Okay. And the way we do this is first we have to allow these two scopes. At the moment, we're only allowing API1. And in terms of the information that we're requesting is open ID, right? So let's go ahead and add RC scope. And uh, <clears throat> if we go to the top here, this is the scope that we're requesting. Again, if you watched the, the previous episode on claims, etc., you know how this works. And as well, we want to request uh, API2 access, right? So let's go ahead, copy this, add this here. And always not to forget, when you're allowing scopes, this means that you're just allowing, right? It's, uh, it's in the name. It, to actually receive these, you actually have to go ahead and specify that you want these scopes. So what you have to do is when you go back to the config here, you're going to request access to secret information. This, that's basically what scope is. Uh, so we want API2 and RC scope. I'll copy RC scope here and let's go ahead and add it. And for API2, we can go ahead and add this. Let's go ahead and launch this. and. Uh, see the claims that we get. Okay, so coming back here, if we go ahead and take a look at the profile, we're not gonna be seeing our claims here just yet. Uh, if we sign in and go to Bob, password, sign in, hopefully they get overridden and they do. So our scope now is open ID, RC scope, API one and API two. If we look in the profile, we're gonna see the RC grandma claim with the big cookie. Right, so this is the thing that we seed in our identity server program.cs. And now if we call the API, we hit a breakpoint, and in the claims here, we will be able to see the RC API grandma big API cookie, right? So again, this is just something that we add to our user when we create it. So these two are basically, again, if you watched the previous episode, now you know that you have access to claims in your API and your client. So when they set up their account, if they upload an image, you can uh, save the URL, you can put it in the claim, and you can send that claim to your client. And uh, now they basically have access to the image and or the email address, etc. You know, all the information that you register on the identity server, you can pass it on to your JavaScript client. And if you have multiple JavaScript clients, you can pass it on to whichever one, whichever you have set up in your configuration here. And for your API, again, if you've learned everything about the authorization uh, policies and uh, creating policies, now that you have access to a claim, you can pretty much secure your API however you want now that you have that claim in your access token. And that claim is coming from the identity server. But how you set that up is up to you. Here, we're just learning about the tools. So another thing uh, is refreshing the token. So because on our... MVC client, so this project right here, uh, the way we refreshed our tokens, if we can go ahead and take a look in the home controller, this is essentially happening on the back end. So when I say back end, that's on the server. All you have in the browser is just the text that it returns, which happens to be in the form of HTML. Uh, so what we do here, we have an HTTP client that calls our identity server on the back end. And basically this uh, communication the browser or the user is never aware of it. The problem that we have with the JavaScript client is that the client, which we would have in the MVC client, comes to the browser, right? So our, our browser, the user's browser, is holding all the information. So the access token and the ID token and the refresh token, we don't actually have access to it because that is a big security compromisation because if you leak a refresh token, you can lose your account because they can infinitely request more access tokens and refresh tokens and you basically screwed at that point. The way you do this in the browser is you have a session. And just to give you an idea of what is going to be happening, if I launch the application again, right here, we're going to be on our client. So this is our JavaScript client here. And uh, 
if we press sign in at the moment we are not signed in so let's go ahead and sign in again okay so now we're back on our client and let's observe what happens if we try to sign in again right so we just end up straight up on our client so this is essentially what we want to do when our access token expires we want to go ahead and do the sign in process again okay but the one thing with this is that the user experience might not be ideal uh, you know how you're using Facebook and the, or YouTube, you're not being redirected to signing in, signing in all the time. That just happens seamlessly. So what actually happens is in the elements, you get an iframe. And this is essentially an iframe that you can't see. It's uh, basically invisible. But in the, in the background, what happens is this iframe is actually pointing to your identity server. And it's keeping your session live. So it's basically, it's doing the process which we're doing here. But sometimes we have to trigger it, trigger it manually. So uh, sometimes we're using it. We're using uh, the APIs, right? So the browser doesn't know when the access token expires. So that's the thing that we want to do. First, we want to find out when the access token expires. And Axios and Angular HTTP client has a concept of interceptors or let's just say HTTP sort of pipeline or middleware where we can basically say, right, if an error occurs, do this. And this is what we're gonna do, right? So if an error occurs, we wanna go ahead, spin up an iframe, visit the identity server, refresh the ax, basically re-sign in and get our new batch of tokens. So let's go ahead and see how we can implement this. So the first part is in our main.js, we would have to implement an Axios interceptor. So with any HTTP client, whichever you use, you want to look for a concept of interceptors or middleware. That's essentially how you find out, right, whenever I get an error, do, the, do, do this function. Okay, and the way to set up an Axios interceptor, we would have to go into the, our Axios inter instance and go into interceptors. And uh, then you can uh, set up an interceptor for a request. And some people like to do this. So an interceptor for the request would add the header to the request. So essentially, before you make every request, the header gets set and not like a global set at the beginning of the initial loadup, but that's what we chose to do here, right? So you can either make a request interceptor or a response interceptor. So the response interceptor is what we're really interested in. And we wanna say use, and here we will be passing two functions. The first function is for a successful response and the second one will be for a error okay so let's go ahead first one uh let's do it in functions first response we want to go ahead and just return the response because this this is a successful response we're not really concerned with it the second thing that we want to pass let's drop these two new lines uh, the second thing that we want to pass is another function and here we're going to be passing the error. And this is really where I am interested in capturing this error and doing stuff with it. So first of all, the way you console log this error is console.log error response. Okay, and now we will be able to see the kind of information there is. And here is again, this is a bit more of an Axios uh, thing, but again, the concept of finding out what the error response is and kind of being able to remake the request after refreshing your token, okay? And after uh, logging this response, we just wanna go ahead and return a promise where we just go ahead and reject the error. Okay, another thing I will do for this example is I will go into the configuration and uh, I will set the lifetime of my access token to be one second, but there is still that leeway, the way we've set it in the auth middleware in the previous episodes, there's basically a leeway of around one minute. So I will have to like cut a video and uh, wait for the access token to expire, but you guys won't have to wait for it. Yeah, so we're setting the access token uh, lifetime to one second. It's really going to be one minute. So what I'm really looking for is to sign in, wait for my access token to expire, and then we can play around with the error and change this JavaScript accordingly. So let's go ahead and start this up. Okay, so here I am. Let's go ahead and sign in. I will sign in as Bob. I'll get my new access token, which has the expiry of like one second. 
And at this point, let's go ahead. I will call the API. I'll remove this breakpoint because there is no need to have this breakpoint. We only wanted to see the claims. And I'll get the secret message. Now, at this point, I'll cut the video to jump to the point where we have the expired token and we'll see what's happening. Okay, so I'm at a point now where my access token has expired. So if I call the API, I will get an error, right? So this object that's returned right here, if we can make it look a little bit more descriptive, let's go ahead and log something like Axios error. Okay, and if we control F5, and again, I'll flick clear the console, call the API, I can see that this is the Axios error that gets uh, printed out. And the real thing that I'm interested in is this status code. The HTTP status codes are well defined and they're part of the HTTP standard specification, whatever you want to call it. Uh, 401 basically tells that we're unauthorized. Okay, so the condition for not being authorized is status being 401. So let's go ahead and check that because if we are getting an error that's a 500 or 400, that might be like server error type of things or we're making a better request. So we want to go to error response status equals 401 and this is where we want to refresh our access token and uh, for the sake of the example what i want to also show you is how to redo the initial request that we have made so again if i go back to the browser and we take a look at this config section right so this configuration essentially contains all the information about the previous request so we have the URL, we have the headers, and in the header we'll see our bearer token, etc., and uh, the method that it's made, right? So this is just the request that we have just made. So if we essentially supply this to the Axios instance, it's going to be able to redo the request. So let's go ahead and see how we do this with Axios. Uh, we are essentially just going to go ahead and first let's uh, extract this config. So Axios config equals error response config we can also log it but i don't think that's necessary all right and actually let's also put some comments uh just sort of a semantical understanding of what this function is meant to do in case you're using some kind of other http client not axios you want to basically replicate this issue right so if uh, error response is 401 uh, try to refresh token Okay, this will be retry the HTTP request, right? So I'm not saying retry Axios uh, request. It's just an HTTP request. So like general instruction type of thing. Next thing I want to know is basically if refreshing, uh, if I'm uh, not refreshing, go ahead and uh, start refreshing, right? Because uh, sometimes you'd make a request and on your uh, app, depending on how it's configured, you might not want to execute subsequent requests or you might want to put them on, on a queue and execute them after. Again, depends on how you're configuring it. This is one of the techniques that you can apply. Basically, if uh, already refreshing, don't make another request. Okay, so I'm, I'm essentially making something like a blocker and the initial value will be false here. Okay. And this is where we want to perform the actual refresh. Okay, uh, I will move this up into this scope as well in a minute, just so we can uh, see what it looks like now. So if I clear this, give this a refresh. So if I call the API, you can see if we're entering this infinite loop. And again, this is just something uh, because of this Axios uh, config not being here. And this is basically what we want to avoid. This is what can happen, right? And again, when you're implementing these sort of things, you have to just, uh, the, these things, you will encounter an error, you, you have a problem, you need to solve that problem, etc. Just the general programming loop. Uh, right, so let's clear the console now. And if I call the API, right, I have the first initial request, and then I have it retrying the request. Okay, so now in between the two happenings, we essentially just want to say, right, refresh my access token and uh, the user manager already provides us with a function so 
Uh, I am, um, by the way, I've seen that when rewatching the video, the reason why I misspelled this was because I misspelled this as well. Uh, it was manger, my preferred way to spell manager, manger. So let's go ahead and rename these to user manager as well. I'll put a semicolon here, right? So getting back to this, we want to gra grab the user manager. And if we go in here, grab user manager, uh, just to refresh myself again, how to, do, how to actually spell this thing. We want to sign in, right? So as I uh, showed the example before, we, we just press the sign in button. That's all we want to do. So I'm looking for sign in. And I want to look for a sign in silent. Okay. And there is also a sign in silent callback. When you have a proper spa application, you want a separate page for your callback for the silent refresh. So same as we have the sign, a sign in callback for the normal sign in flow, you will want a separate page. So like sign in silent. And that's when you where you want to sort of redirect. But we're not going to go that deep in this tutorial. We just want to do the sign in silent refresh. So I'm just going to grab the name of this function and let's call this. And again, this will be a promise. So then result and we want to do whatever in the result, right? And again, I'm just going to move this up here. And because Axios itself is a promise, that's what I want to return, right? So Again, this is just JavaScript stuff. So we want to return a promise from this function. Axios is a promise, so we're going to be returning this. And to return a promise from this promise, we just have to return this as well. Okay. So this is essentially how we're going to close out this Axios uh, request. So from the beginning, we make an Axios promise. And then after the get, this is where we're going to be in the interceptor. And uh, the request will fail, we'll go through this pipeline, and then essentially this request will re resolve to itself kind of thing, right? We are at a point of refreshing. Let's go ahead and just console log res, right? So we're just going to console log the result and see what's there. We are not doing any refreshing just yet because remember that we set the access token here. So we will essentially have to do the same thing. But let's uh, before we do that stuff, let's go ahead and just console log uh, the result here. So uh, let's refresh. Let me actually clear the whole thing. Uh, I'll call the API. And again, in between, we will just see this object, which is again, all the user information. So that's how we have access to the new ID token to the new access token. And this again, we should really rename it to user because that's kind of what it is. And uh, now we want to basically change the Axios configuration to accept a new access token. So let's go ahead, copy this. We will put this here. This is basically going to set the defaults on Axios. But remember that we are retrying this request. So what we actually want to do is grab this Axios config. And if we look at the configuration itself, we'll have to go to the headers and we will have to set the authorization header to be this bearer token, right? So let's go ahead and grab the headers part here and we'll grab the rest here as well, right? So for the baseline, we're going to set the access token. And for this current request, we're also going to set the access token. Okay. So uh, the kind of step uh, here, I guess we can describe it is to uh, update the HTTP request and client. Okay. Because that's access client. Here's where we are updating the client. Here's where here is where we are updating the request. So if I go back here and Control F5, clear all this, call the API, and I guess this initial call to API, what has actually happened is because we refreshed the token on our previous pass. Now we're actually we actually have a new token in our storage. So this has actually put in a new token on our storage. So what we want to do is uh, just for the sake of an example, I'm going to cut the video here. And again, I'm going to wait for the one or two minutes for it to expire. And then I'm going to make a call, which will essentially go through the steps. So before we go ahead and do that, I'll just put a couple of console logs here so we can see what's happening. So let's mark this as new user. Uh, let's say here console log uh, starting token refresh. 
And instead of uh, logging the Axios error here, let's actually just say something a little bit more descriptive. Or actually, no, never mind. Let's keep this here. Instead, here, I would actually like to put something like this and say um, Axios error 401, right? So what we'll see is basically Axios error, the kind of stuff that we have there. We will see the error code. We'll see that we're starting the refresh. And then we'll see the new user, and then we're going to be seeing the retry of the request. So now all we have to do is just give it a few minutes. So after waiting some time, let's go ahead and uh, press the Call API button. Uh, there we go. So the first initial one is uh, just a 401. So we get the Axios error where we can get all the information. Then we output Ax Axios error 401, starting refresh token. Undefined. So this part is actually where we get redirected back to our sign-in page, and that's where the refresh happens. So internally, in uh, the iframe that gets rendered here, you're going to be redirected back to the sign-in page. So essentially, the process that I was showing, we're clicking on the sign-in button. That's what's going to happen in the background in the iframe, and then there is going to extract the stuff from the URL back into your local storage. And then when we're retrying the request, we get the secret message again, right? And uh, now any subsequent calls are going to succeed as well. Now, another thing you might stumble upon when using the OIDC client library is uh, if you're reading for the documentation, you might find this automatic silent renew option. Uh, I'm just telling you right now that this is something, if you enable this option, is going to try to refresh, tr basically track the expiry of your access token in the background and try to refresh it automatically. Do not do this, implement your own mechanism. This was meant to be like a silver bullet, but now again, because it's implemented in some places, they can't remove it and uh, it was a bad decision to put it in as they were talking about it because it, it generally, it causes a lot of problems and it doesn't work for all solutions. So what was meant to be a silver bullet turned out to be like a plastic bullet, <laughs> I guess you can say. So yeah. Just warning you right now, if you stumble upon this option and you want to use the automatic silent renew, don't use it. Um, implement your own pipeline, okay? Uh, but this will be essentially it for this episode. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, leave a like, subscribe. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments section. Don't forget to join the Discord server. Link is in the description. And as always, I'll see you around.